Again, my name is Robert Lindsay, and I'm so glad to be back here this year. It's always a thrill to come and uh, have Zach host us all. And looking out over the audience, I can see uh, a couple of faces that could just as well and possibly better present what I'm going to cover today. The uh, topic of children's and adolescent sleep um, is a bit of a rev review for most people. Yesterday we had a lot of new topics, a lot of new information, some Byron covered about the future of sleep medicine and so forth. Uh, this is going to be a review to most people. We're going to try to lighten the mood and uh, give some good examples of uh, what to look out for and what we may encounter in the sleep lab and then conclude toward the end of the presentation with uh, some anxiety mood disorders that are found in children and some uh, one or two disorders that are uh, unique to adolescents, but the majority of my presentation today will be about the uh, children K through 12. Um, I say K through 12, but really K through middle school. Um, no disclosures. If you don't recognize this fellow's face, this is Dr. Richard Berber. He is the father of uh, pediatric sleep medicine in this country. He opened the first all uh, children's pediatric sleep center in 1978 in Boston. So our objectives for today, understand what contributes to good sleep hygiene. So as you can see right away, some of Dr. Talent's uh, message, I'm going to have dovetailed into my presentation. And we didn't compare, obviously, but um, that may get us to the break a little quicker. So uh, <laughs> being Friday, I'm sure everybody's excited about that. Uh, we want to be able to describe why good sleep quality is important to children's well-being and their growth. And we want to be able to differentiate uh, between children's and adult sleep architecture. Um, and to describe at least two disorders that are unique to children. Okay. So one of the things that Dr. Talent covered that I'll review uh, with a few more graphics is the physiology of uh, sleep. Uh, neurocognitive effects on sleep disruption, uh, the recommended sleep times, which you'll quickly see and notice that they have uh, you know, very few people you know um, have this much sleep, <laughs> not just because of cell phones, but just because of uh, you know, how busy everybody is. And as we said yesterday, speaking of how busy everybody is, even the you know, retirees uh, one of the presentations I recall yesterday talked about the uh, smart apps and who was most likely to use them, the old you know, retired folks. So um, there's sleep disorders uh, that we're going to talk about that involve insomnia that are most focused around behavioral insomnia. And of course, sleep disordered breathing we can't overlook. And then some non-REM parasomnias and a few psychiatric conditions. Okay, so everybody knows what we record, uh, what our montage is, what the channels look like on a polysomnogram. Um, I want to direct your attention to the last bullet on this slide, because everybody else knows pretty much you know, what we're talking about. The amplitude of the waveforms we can uh, assume to see uh, have much greater amplitude on children and so forth, and so we'll skip over that. Um, you should be familiar with vital signs, though, because children's vital signs, their heart rates and so forth, are going to be much different in an all-child uh, lab um, from night to night than an adult lab. But setting the stage, I had a colleague who actually spoke at this conference quite often and could be back in the future. But uh, her philosophy was, um, you know, keep the rooms, the testing rooms, like hotel room, keep them very welcoming and so forth, comforters on the bed, that kind of thing. Don't put your wires out until, you know, you're about ready to hook somebody up. My personal philosophy and experience in patient care on this is that if you, especially with children, set the stage of the night's testing very early and have things neatly laid out, when the parent and child come through the door, um, you know, obviously you can establish a very nice rapport with them, but you, you need to make it, in my opinion, again, there's people in here that can uh, anecdotally share with you many other experiences as I look to see, you know, Kevin and Byron and some others. But if you set that stage so that with a child especially, you can make them comfortable, 
sit down and show that, you know, we're not here to play. We're here to get a test on you. You know, and here's the order it's going to go in. And this is often, of course, why most facilities, most programs will have one-on-one -on -one staffing ratios with children. Um, I'm a director now. I switch in my career. I've kind of gone back and forth about every five to seven years between direct patient care and, and managing a program. And my philosophy, I guess, always has been, you know, keep things moving. And sidetracked myself, but back to the ratios. Keep things moving with the hookup and so forth, but you have to initially establish that rapport, especially you know, with a child that's never been to a hospital. Now, some of the children, obviously, that have other disorders that we're going to see in the sleep center have been through multiple stages of testing. Uh, Down syndrome patients, uh, children that have neuromuscular problems, they've been through lots of testing. So sleep lab is going to be a cakewalk. But to establish the night and get yourself off to a good start, even if you have one-on-one -on -one staffing, um, you know, you're going to be much better uh, prepared for a good test. And of course, with a child, you know, once they're out, they're usually out. I mean, it's, it's a much easier night after lights out. Okay, so as you set the stage, explain every step of the way, the children uh, in the range of middle school and up, I found, are a little harder, and I'm sure there's stories here, harder to manage because of uh, their interaction with parents. And it's funny, the time that I spent in the state of Alabama at uh, DCH, they could drop their kids off there at 14, and the parent didn't have to stay. It's state law in Alabama. But most everywhere it's you know 18, you've got a parent staying over with the child. And so you've got not only the patient, but the patient's you know, family to deal with. And uh, with COVID, you know, most uh, of that's been limited to one person. Uh, some labs allow a couple, depending on uh, the child and the background of the child. Now, as I said, we're going to lighten this up just a little bit, being Friday. This is our test subject for the night. This is little Johnny Rotten. And little Johnny Rotten has been expelled from pre-K. He's looks like trouble, doesn't he? <laughs> He's uh, tried to put the cat in the dryer. He burned down his sister's dollhouse. And he's you know, got all the symptoms of either ADHD or sleep disorder breathing. And physicians will tell you, and you can look this up, that the differential for sleep disorder breathing and the symptoms and so forth are almost identical for a child's behavior. As many of you know, they don't get really sleepy. They self-stimulate. They get in trouble. They have behavioral problems and they cause trouble um, in many social situations. So if this child happens to come to your lab and they've got an ongoing power struggle with their parent who's in attendance of the sleep study, you know, you could be in for a heck of a night, undoubtedly. But the child needs help. And one of the things that yes, yesterday was presented that uh, I recall about the uh, tonsillectomy you know, being mentioned for the children, much of what I think is leading this personally in my time in the field and so forth, I think that a lot of the childhood obesity creeps on even as a result or after tonsillectomy because a lot of those kids never come back for testing. The parents say, oh, no, little Johnny never snores anymore, but they still can have apnea, right? So those kids go on having apnea, especially in REM, and their hunger hormones, you know, ghrelin and leptin, continue to you know, play on them like uh, carb surges do for shift workers. It's no different because of sleep deprivation. And you know, they get big. They never get retested. One of the things that I was thinking of that I'd read from the WatchPat literature yesterday is that the FDA, not the ASM, but the FDA has cleared their devices to go down uh, to age 12 for home sleep testing. So there's some newer and newer things that are going to preclude some of the patients from coming in, but the ones with neuromuscular problems, obviously, and behavioral problems that are suspected of having sleep disordered breathing, they'll always be with us. So especially for a child like this, you want to set the stage, set some limits, and make sure that you know, you're off to a good start. And hopefully with a child like this, your manager has been kind enough to assign you one-on-one -on -one staffing. Okay. So this is a little bit of review um, from what Dr. Talent covered.
on sleep regulation and the physiology of it. So I'm just going to click on through this and present uh, sleep central, which is the hypothalamus. And the middle area there is a pituitary gland. And the last one there, well, let me back up. The pineal gland, and of course, the light that is entrained, you know, drives this whole situation of, you know, um, suprachiasmatic nucleus anchoring your 24-hour cycle. And within that, something that he didn't cover, and I was going to get into a little bit, is that you've got uh, an interaction between the light and all these neurotransmitters that keep everything rolling. You know, we, we've learned from other in-services and from our past education, uh, you know, see, Acetylcholine is REM on, serotonin is REM off, and then you've got some other um, neurotransmitters that play into that we'll cover in a few minutes. But the sleep cycle within a child is just like the sleep cycle within an adult, except for some stage percentage differences. And we know that, that we can expect some higher amplitude in their N3 sleep. The majority of their sleep uh, is going to be like that. You can expect some of the old folks in here that are like me can expect some pin blocking. Uh, you remember from instrumentation, and you may have to adjust your filters a little bit so that you can accurately capture that. And especially in your younger techs that have never seen that, um, to differentiate that between uh, actual pin blocking and artifact. Because first time you see it, if you don't know, it may look it's irregular and, and some sort of uh, recording artifact, but in adults, we've got uh, more REM occurring late, and of course, any sleep-disordered breathing, we can imagine either a child or an adult having uh, being worse in REM. Uh, the ASM still uh, covers staging rules, excuse me, staging and scoring rules uh, for children under 13, and we, of course, uh, know those and will apply those for you know, children that have the sleep-disordered breathing or Something else that's not in my presentation with kids that is a little bit beyond the scope of this and more instrumentation is the recognition of seizures and spike in waves within uh, especially children's recordings. Okay, so these sleep times, the total sleep times that are recommended by the National Sleep Foundation and the ASM. Back in 2003, the National Sleep Foundation every year you know, has a sleep week. And that sleep week happens to be in the spring every year. Uh, in March, when the time changes, I used to do a uh, phone-in radio show in Chattanooga where we'd go uh, twice a year when the time changes, and then a back-to-school segment, all having to do with children's sleep. And the, the thing about the uh, length of recommended sleep time in all ages is that in most developed countries, uh, it's nowhere near being achieved. And so when you add sleep disordered breathing or some other disorder to that, you know, you get a child that's, you know, going to have behavioral challenges. And uh, as we'll see in another couple of slides from now, uh, possibly if they develop this early enough, they just have a disorder early enough, they can be mislabeled as uh, learning impaired, uh, even have lower IQ. And sleep regulation. Dr. Talent you know, covered a lot of that. And um, the whole you know, light entrainment in the suprachiasmatic nucleus is a just constant ebb and flow of neurotransmitter you know, that's, that's driven by light. The light is kind of the pump, and the neurotransmitters you know, just run that um, drive uh, over the 24 hour cycle. So, Growth hormone, the reason this is most important to children, obviously, is to have them grow. If there's certain stages of sleep being suppressed, their growth can be affected. It's not always affected, but I've got a friend who's got a child that had their tonsils out at age six or seven. The child was short for their age and really had been mislabeled in a couple of ways, but after the tonsils were out, the sleep disorder breathing resolved, the child grew about four inches in a year. I mean, it was just incredible. Doesn't always happen, but if you talk to enough pediatric uh, neurologists, pediatric uh, sleep specialists, you'll find that that's, that's not entirely uncommon. 
prolactin levels, um, increase later in the night, luteinizing hormone. Does everybody know what luteinizing hormone is? It's a hormone secreted uh, by the pituitary gland that uh, drives in, in younger people, children, uh, sexual maturation. And, and in adults, it can help drive, when breathing is restored, libido. So this is why, especially with men who have sleep disorder breathing, their wives carry them to the sleep doctor. They get their CPAP and they get treated. And you know their private life regains a new luster. So uh, cortisol, we talk to patients all the time about cortisol and how if you're having long apneas and your heart runs wild at the end of that apnea to try to recirculate what oxygen you've got left, you know, you're, you're releasing this uh, hormone from your adrenal glands and it's being reabsorbed and eventually leads to plaque. So this is going to lead to heart disease when untreated and not so much in children, but especially if you know, kids develop obesity earlier, they're going to be more susceptible to that. Dream sleep. We know that um, in adults, it's uh, abnormal and called REM behavior disorder to be acting out your dreams. In children, not necessarily in dream sleep, but with uh, other stages of sleep, you know, we have lots more movement. If you've ever had a child, a toddler, or a child in the bed with you, they've crawled in bed, and they kick, they climb, they twirl around, they don't even know they're doing it. And uh, we'll talk about co-sleeping here in a few minutes. And, you know, there's uh, a very pointed reference. Uh, That's not my opinion, and it's going to be a little controversial, but the uh, reference about uh, uh, medical opinion on co-sleeping. So, you know, dream content... can obviously vary in children and adults. For children, it can be very uh, discomforting and scary. And it's not always in REM. You know, there are uh, some dreams that are in non-REM stages of sleep, but we do, of course, majority by dreaming in REM. Okay, so neurocognitive defects on children. Uh, unfortunately, except for anecdotal evidence and um, some you know, improved test scores, there's limited uh, data, formal data, I should say, that's been collected on this. Uh, sleep restriction and experimental studies uh, can show um, changes in EEG, and again, the data are inconsistent on uh, the... So adults, we know that lack of REM sleep can be correlated and associated with uh, memory difficulty, but it's not so conclusive with children. Children uh, suffering a breathing disorder, PLMD, or uh, other sleep disorder, ADHD. And this is a side story, again, because at this point in my career, I feel almost uh, compelled <laughs> to tell stories. But this is of a practice, a pediatric practice in Chattanooga that's I'll go ahead and tell the name of it, Highland Pediatrics. They, they may have changed this, but back in 2004, if you were to call their number and ask for Dr. A, Dr. B, Dr. C, or refills, you could ask for refills on one line, but then the fifth choice was if you need Ritalin. Ritalin had its own uh, you know, <laughs> selection on voicemail. So, um, you know, not good, but it's treated much the same is uh, sleep disordered breathing until a child gets that adenotonsillectomy and gets uh, squared away with their breathing, hopefully tested to make sure that the uh, surgery was effective and there's no refractory apnea. So sleep restriction, sleep deprivation, of course, in children and uh, adults uh, uh, can impair verbal development, decrease creativity, and uh, impact problem solving. Now the Chattanooga reference down here is not the one that I just mentioned, it's to a different one. An eight-year-old that presented with uh, an IQ of 92, 94, somewhere just below, you know, low normal, is tested, uh, reading comprehension's poor, turns out she has severe central sleep apnea. She gets fixed, gets put on, back then she weighed just enough to be put on ASV, and retested. And her IQ went up like 15 or 20 percent, 
reading comprehension, she was promoted from one grade to two additional grades the next school year. So it can have a huge impact on their ability to learn and to move along. And unfortunately, there's just not a whole big wealth of data on it like there are uh, adult studies and adult uh, difficulties. So um, we know just from anecdotal reports that there's lower academic achieve achievement in some children, uh, that the treatment of OSA through a genotonsillectomy or uh, CPAP can improve uh, school performance. And the children who consistently score, um, you know, will have uh, some residual effects, at least uh, some did in this one sample. Animal models, is, this is an interesting side note, have shown that they have increased cell loss in the hippocampus in rats that are exposed to intermittent hypoxia. So while we can't really prove apnea in rats, we can show the hypoxia. And along with that, task acquisition is uh, decreased and uh, degraded compared to the control groups. OK, so 25% of all children, and this is according to the American Academy of Pediatrics 20 years ago. This is the most recent data I could find. Are going to have a sleep problem at some point during their childhood. Sleep resistance, or rather bedtime resistance and anxiety, um, really are focused around younger children that are toddlers, pre-K, and up through uh, elementary school ages. And then older children, as Gabe, uh, Dr. Talent was mentioning, uh, have more problems with delayed sleep onset and you know, delayed sleep phase and so forth. But um, the self-reports uh, that explain sleep disorders and excessive daytime sleepiness, you know, show some pretty clear and startling information. Um, a, another story I want to tell you about uh, N3, about growth hormone, of course, it's secreted in uh, N3 sleep. There was a MSLT that it's one of the first that I ran when I was being trained in 1991. And uh, young lady, 18 years old, she was uh, referred by the pediatrician, and this is why I think of this story. She had had a night before a sleep study that, again, I'm new. I scored the record, and I came out with uh, either 65 or 68 percent slow wake sleep. So Dr. Viscomi. Uh, Byron knows him, <laughs> comes running across the hall with his paper record. He throws it down and throws a little fit and says, what in the you know, heck is this? And I said, well, this, here, look at it. Turns out, Jonathan knows him too, uh, turns out that uh, the young lady was pregnant. Okay, And she <laughs> had been sent to the lab after that by Dr. Scomi, And her pregnancy, in effect, had been diagnosed by a sleep study. <laughs> because of all this N3 sleep. So the funny things that you find in a sleep lab, uh, other than sleep disordered breathing. But, uh, and so the follow-up, you can imagine, beyond the test for narcolepsy, was quite interesting with the parents. <laughs> okay, so SIDS, and we're going to talk about co-sleeping and stuff here in a few minutes, but the incidence of sudden infant death syndrome has you know, dropped dramatically in the country, still worldwide. It's a problem, obviously, and efforts to contain it, you know, are mainly based around education and re-education, because for a lot of young mothers, uh, even, you know, second time, third time mothers, it's very convenient to nurse with the child in the bed. Well, fact is, at that age, especially between ages one month and 14 months, Co-sleeping, for whatever reason, it carries a 10 times greater likelihood of the child having SIDS and dying. So, you know, that's a double-edged sword. I understand it's very convenient and so forth and the reasons for it and so, you know, bonding and all that kind of stuff. But um, once you start that, again, beyond breastfeeding, uh, as we're going to see in a couple of slides, it's very hard to stop. So here's a little uh, intro to the uh, co-sleeping <laughs> where the children are resistant to sleep in their own bed. Um, lots of little memes out there like that that uh, you can pull. So 
This all kind of ties in and is adjacent to pediatric insomnia. Most pediatric insomnia we know is behavioral and, and almost learned because of a couple of different factors. Uh, some of it's limit setting, as many of you studied before. Some of it has to do with the, the child just won't stay in their bed. They won't stay in their room. They want to be up with the family and they don't want to go to bed and think that they're going to miss something. So in co-sleeping, we find that this really is fueled because even though they're in the same bed, they want to stay up as late as the parent. And this just compounds the problem and makes that sleep association more difficult for uh, the child. And obviously, that dovetails into the fact that they're going to develop insufficient sleep, or their sleep times are going to be too short. And they'll nap throughout the day. And I can remember relatives, nephews, even my own child, my daughter, between functions, uh, look in the back sleep, they get them in a car seat, and they're out. So they make up for it. They find a way. But you don't want a sleep disorder breathing child reaching middle school and then get behind the wheel of a car, and they still have you know, uh, pathologic sleepiness. We'll talk about narcolepsy in a few minutes, but in the incidence of it, I've got two narcoleptics in my house, believe it or not. The incidence is less than 1%, now without cataplexy, but... Uh, my wife and my stepson both got type 2 and just, you know, can sleep all day and all night if it wasn't for pro vigil. So, very interesting what, you know, can be found. Back to what was been mentioned about electronics in Gabe's presentation. Personally, and I think anecdotally, and the data will bear this out at some point, this is the number one threat, blue light, tablets, phones, and so forth the number one threat to children's sleep. And young adults, most of us would argue. So take that as, it will, as you will. Uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. I think that looking back, of course, I wasn't alive when TV rolled out, but uh, when different technology rolls out, I think that you know, society eventually adapts to it. And in this case, I don't think it adapt, can adapt soon enough because there is so much that we have, whether it's a laptop, a tablet, or a cell phone that's going to drive this. And without that technology, you know, they can't do their schoolwork, can't talk to their friends. I mean, it's just it's a disruption of what society's become and what expectancy, what social expectancy has become. Okay, so prevalence: up to six percent of the general population of kids. Uh, deemed to have insomnia of some kind. A uh, leading study shows that uh, ages 5 to 16, half of those presented to the sleep center for complaints consistent with insomnia and uh, had some other pre-existing uh, psychological diagnosis such as depression or anxiety. And the remaining 50% uh, showed elevated uh, impairment on psychometric evaluations, whether those be achievement tests or personality, not personality inventories, but IQ tests. Okay. So behavioral insomnia. This is what we were kind of edging toward with uh, co-sleeping. And we'll do a little slide on co-sleeping shortly. But, um, you know, watching TV, we've all heard the adult and the general sleep hygiene tips about, you know, save your bedroom just for sleep and sex. No TV, no writing. In, well, nobody writes in a checkbook anymore. but. No, nothing in the bedroom, so, and that includes TV. But TVs are so cheap now, most people have got them in every, ha every room in their house, on the porch, in the basement, above the stove in the kitchen. I mean, they're everywhere because they're so cheap. And they're certainly in the bedroom. And they're bigger now in the bedroom because they're cheaper. And so the bigger the TV in the bedroom, the more light that you're going to get. And I know that you all know folks that say, oh, well, I can sleep. I can go to sleep better by you know, listen to the TV, the background noise, which is the white noise, but the light still makes it through the opacity of their eyelids, and they still respond to it. If you had EEG on them and could watch them, you've seen this in the sleep lab probably, if you left a TV on in the room, you can see that they're responding to that. So uh, if the child is unable to fall asleep and any of these correlates are present, then there's going to be problems. And it's, it's very 
difficult to unwind or to back off of any of these and if, if it's ever started. So um, there's a whole probably lecture series that you could do on great sleep hygiene for children. Um, but what I wanted to kind of die on the hill of or die on this hill is about is co sleeping is that, you know, there's a reason for it again, I think, with nursing mothers, but the fact is there's more cons than pros in the long run. The incidence of SIDS we talked about, uh, it is very difficult to break. And despite uh, anecdotal reports of moms and dads, you know, talking about oxytocin and all this, you know, love hormone and everything about the togetherness, the fact is they're all over the bed and they disturb the parent's sleep whether the parent wakes up or not. And so if you had, again, an EG cap or an EG set of electrodes on the parents laying there, you would see that there's arousals every time the kid moves. And you may have seen this you know, in the sleep lab under certain conditions, but the fact is that you have developed something that um, is an association with bedtime. And bedtime routines, bedtime rituals, of course, we know are very important. So this is the reference. Pedia Clinic, Dr. Sh uh, Schmidt and Barron. This is not Robert Lindsay. <laughs> Okay, but here's what they say about co-sleeping. That it's a parental decision. It's not a medically advised decision. Uh, children almost always uh, want to stay up as late as their parents. Uh, parental sleep will be in, uh, interrupted, not enhanced. Uh, long term, you know, it can be obviously disruptive to the marriage or a relationship. And that co-sharing is never a long-term solution to sleep problems. Uh, the longer it happens, the longer it will take to break. I talked about the greater incidence of SIDS. And unfortunately, that trend you know, is you know, something that's continuously tracked, and it's not changing. Uh, worst case, if you have to try to wean them off of this, it's my phone ringing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I never, people who know me know that my ringer is never turned up. So I don't know why, but... If I can step off here and good God. Oh gosh. How embarrassing. Okay, so to wean them off of this, one of the references that I checked says to maybe sleep in the same room with them and then just, you know, tiptoe out once you're sure that they're really asleep. But if they gain that association with bedtime and maybe a story or playing with a pet or something other than TV tablet or cell phone, okay? Could be helpful. So what we're all about, 90 plus percent of our business, sleep disorder breathing. Uh, and primary snoring, you know, some parents think that the fact that little Johnny or little Janie snores is cute. Unfortunately, that's one of the things that the public latches onto and makes it so hard for us to um, promote what we do when uh, there's an absence of uh, you know, buy-in, I guess, from the parents. If they just think that snoring is benign, then nothing happens. And the fact is, most pediatricians and primary care doctors still don't ask about snoring or sleep. Um, it's getting better, but uh, when my kids were little, early 90s and 99, 2000, they were four or five years old before those questions started. So better late than never. But um, one of the things that we talked about yesterday, of course, was hypoventilation. In the sleep lab, ideally, we would want to have uh, transcutaneous uh, CO2 monitoring. Most folks do in tidal CO2 monitoring. Uh, good luck with that, keeping a cannula and a PTAF or a, uh, all that onto a uh, three-year-old. Um, Four-year-olds, you know, five-year-olds, it's all the same. They're going to be pulling it off. And one of the things about the hookup, and I'll stop with it for instrumentation for just a minute, but one of the children that I ran a few years ago, you know, we'd had pediatric belts. All the equipment was designed for pediatrics. The one thing that people don't think of sometimes is the cabling from the jack box and the oximeter. This child had done a gator roll and rolled and rolled and rolled, and I happened to go in to uh, fix something, but discovered this. And so from then after, from thereafter, 
I'd tape the cable to the side of the bed so they could, you know, do that and choke themselves because this was this was a kind of a near miss. I mean, by the time we'd have known the child was in trouble, it would have been a very very bad outcome. So, um, equipment obviously is important. Uh, we want to make sure that we can detect hypoventilation if it's happening in children because it's it's so uh, important to uh, report that in real time to the referring doctors with some values if we can put those values with it. Obviously the child's not going to have an ABG. The child's just going to have what we can report on their sleep study. Epidemiology up to 12 percent, and this is old data, uh, primary snoring, uh, obstructive sleep apnea 1 to 2 percent. We all know that's probably low, but of the folks that uh, do fill out surveys and return surveys, these are the percentages. So. Okay, so clinical presentation. We talked about what you hear physically, what you observe, but in the sleep lab and at home, there's frequent awakenings, there's excessive daytime sleepiness, there's uh, poor academic performance, irritability, uh, social distress and trouble, uh, poor executive function, poor decision making, even at uh, pediatric level, um, and inattention and general cognitive impairment that uh, can be reversed. Not always, though. So ideally, we'd like our chunky little kids that are hooked on Xbox to lose weight. But um, short of that, adenotonsillectomy, CPAP, possible positional therapy, and um, we know that tonsillectomy is still first-line treatment. The challenge is, is to get those referring physicians to send back the child four to six months postoperatively to make sure that the surgery was effective. Most children aren't going to snore anymore, but they can still have some apnea and some desaturations without snoring, as adults can, obviously. So as you market, as you educate the community, uh, if you do presentations in high schools and so forth, uh, seek out those uh, high school nurses, because the nurses talk to the parents. and um, Seek opportunities to educate folks that, you know, you need to follow up on this. If they ever had apnea, just because they had a tonsillectomy doesn't mean that they are now uh, healed or cured from apnea. Uh, so Non-REM non parasomnia, as we all know about sleepwalking, sleep talking, enuresis, and these others. But the first three right here, of course, are going to happen in the first third of the night. And they can all be um, promoted or kind of exacerbated by sleep deprivation or poor quality sleep. I remember once, uh, the only episode of sleepwalking I had was after a long, long period of sleep deprivation. And a friend of mine who was a roommate actually followed me. It was in a, a, a summer camp uh, setting of uh, Army Reserve training, an annual training two-week period, and um, followed me across two or three hundred yards between four or five different barracks and you know, turned me around in the dark and brought me back. But, um, been up for about 22 hours at that point and uh, long convoy ride from Chattanooga. But the main thing is, is that our folks that have got sleep disorder breathing or some other sleep disorder that's going to decrement their sleep efficiency and their sleep quality are more susceptible to this. And there's one missing off of this that sleep deprivation can promote. But it's a REM parasomnia, and that is sleep paralysis. I did a survey back in 2001 and published a, a brief you know, observational report in Sleep Magazine about uh, third shift nurses and first shift nurses and the incidence of sleep paralysis and the con contribution there of sleep deprivation and shift work uh, obviously caused much more sleep paralysis. I can remember in the late 90s when I was coming off of night shift, my first night off, I tried to cycle back and sleep at night. I'd wake up two hours later, couldn't move. Just it's incredible. It happens to a lot of people, but if that kind of thing or any of these kinds of things happens in children, the non rem parasomnia, they're probably not going to remember. Confusional arousals, everything that they have very little recall of, and they're not going to be able to um, you know, help you get them back to bed if they've you know, walked out of bed. 
So, first 30 minutes, excuse me, duration, 1 to 30 minutes, the child's probably going to have complete amnesia of the event. And it is a familial thing. Uh, my dad, for example, 86 years old, every time we've been on vacation together, sleep talks. I sleep talk. And so it's just, it's got a familial and genetic comp component to it. Uh, again, we all know that most of these occur in slow wave sleep. They're more common in childhood. And the attempts to awaken somebody, if a parent is kind of dumbfounded and doesn't understand what's going on and tries to wake the child, you know, or wake a person, an adult, uh, it's not going to be very helpful. Psychopathology uh, having to do with uh, real mental illness, such as schizophrenia and so forth, uh, Pretty rare in children, pretty uh, far-fetched to contribute to any non-REM parasomnias, uh, such as uh, daytime hallucinations. Uh, night terrors, one of the more frequent complaints that pediatricians and sleep specialists hear about children. Um, they can last anywhere up to three minutes. Uh, again, there's complete amnesia. And the gender preferences leans toward male children. Uh, females, possibly more into adulthood. In adults, uh, maybe up to 2%, 2.6%. Um, but again, a night terror in a child, you know, we know from the sleep lab and stage recognition, but in, a, in an adult, night terrors and data are going to be confused with uh, nightmares, you know, or actual REM. So, uh, night terror episode characterized by, you know, a sudden uh, abrupt shift in uh, posture. Uh, screaming, display of intense fear, autonomic reactions, little memory of the event again. And, uh, again, can't wake the patient up. You can't wake the child up. They're very difficult to arouse. And the episodes uh, can last you know, well into a half hour. The confusional arousal, um, we've seen this in the sleep lab. Anybody who's ever tested children has probably seen this. Uh, and so I would say uh, the Stockholm study of 4% is, you know, pretty low. Um, so the confusional arousal is going to act, uh, going to last, you know, longer than a couple of minutes, and it's just automatic. And again, there's complete amnesia, but uh, this can be like uh, Dr. Talent again was talking about a, an example of a patient of making uh, gestures like they're eating or they're swatting a fly in front of their face or they get up and they do all that physical movement and talk at the same time. So that's, again, most, most of what I've seen in a sleep lab. So the treatment of these. Um, good gosh. Well, I have kept you entertained. Um, treatment of these that are ongoing are really uh, increasing uh, total sleep time. Some afternoon naps can help. Um, you want to make sure to safeguard the environment and make sure that there's no potential for the child to injure themselves if they have one of these episodes, especially sleepwalking. Um, these are things that we kind of prepare for in the sleep lab. We make sure that we have you know, outlet covers over the electrical outlets and all kinds of uh, things to uh, protect the room that they're in and so forth. But, uh, home is a different story, and in a patient's family who is, shall we say, a little less uh, aware of their child and their child's environment, um, that's where the, the uh, impact or the uh, emphasis of the CCSH comes in. I mean, you need to become a sleep advocate, a coach to the family, and you know, let them know that, hey, this, this child's got a problem that may not go away anytime soon. And, and talk to them about some of that. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, questions like these on that exam, if you all have not taken it and want to. It's a very interesting exam. Uh, so the treatment, benzos, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, basically um, suppressants. So uh, just like with REM, I mean, you can suppress these, but the question becomes how much medicine do you want to put a child on it for how long like this? Um, it's a tough decision. 
but I guess it has to be coupled with uh, you know, cost benefits of uh, how much or how often it happens and how much danger the child could be in. For example, you know, a child that sleepwalks um, may be some more environmental and physical danger, danger than uh, ones who just have confusional arousals. REM behavior disorder, uh, excuse me, not REM behavior disorder, but REM disorders, primary, primarily narcolepsy, um, very, very rare incidents. Less than 1% of the population has type 1 narcolepsy. And in kids, you know, it's going to be treated as it always has in adults with, if, it, if there's cataplexy present with sodium oxalate and modafinil. Uh, for just type 2, you know, provigil or new vigil. Um, unfortunately, narcolepsy is not diagnosed for up to 10 years in people, in adolescents or in young adults, because of the symptoms, they get sent to so many different doctors and different specialists until they make it to the sleep lab. Uh, it could be that they're not diagnosed because you think of some of the uh, symptoms, hypnagogic hallucinations, hypnopompic hallucinations, sleep paralysis. You know, if you, you know, recite all these symptoms to a primary care doctor or a psychologist, then you, know, you may get put on a different track of care than through a sleep lab. So of all these that have type 1, 68% have cataplexy and um, Again, Hale is the researcher most noted for uh, reporting the incidence of this. Uh, of course, characteristics what we see in the sleep lab, sleep onset REM on the night before test, and then throughout the MSLT the next day, we're looking for positive uh, cell REM. And uh, to correlate all that with the patient's sleep history, uh, any incidence of uh, sleep attacks or sleep paralysis, which indicate the severity and speak to the severity of the problem um, in their, their patient's life outside of the sleep lab. Okay, so how is it treated beyond uh, medicine? Frequent napping uh, probably ought to be at the top of this list instead of uh, strict sleep-wake cycle and frequent napping are probably uh, equally important. Increase physical activity and avoid risky situations. So what would be a risky situation for a narcoleptic? Okay, comedy club, <laughs> anything like that. I mean, so you get the idea. So they should avoid that even while on medication. Because medication, again, doesn't eradicate something. In this case, it's just going to reduce the likelihood of it happening. Uh, children with psychiatric conditions. And unfortunately, there's a slew of patients, uh, pediatric patients, that get misdiagnosed with ADHD. Uh, true ADHD, in, in my learning and research is just, it, it's kind of rare um, given uh, compared to what we really see. About 25 years ago, some of y'all know uh, Paula Williams who spoke, speaks at this uh, conference quite a bit. She and I gave a presentation to some school nurses down in Chattanooga before the school year started. It's a group of about 50 school nurses. And at the end of it, we asked, does anyone want to ask any questions? And one of the uh, questions that we asked after we'd answered what we were there for, or what questions they had for us. What percentage uh, of children, K through 12, do you think are on Ritalin or some other stimulant? And said 25, 30, no. Their estimate was 45% of the entire school system. That's just crazy. That's just, uh, that's wild. But uh, of these that are diagnosed, again, whether it's any one of the disorders uh, related to a psychiatric condition or these others, almost exclusively male. Um, there's developmental delays that can be uh, measured. And again, there's not a whole huge body of research to go look at to see uh, you know, dips and then increases in IQ and psychometric test reporting. But um, there are plenty of anxiety disorders that you know, can be tracked through uh, the amount of antidepressant medicine that's dispensed. Uh, one of the non-REM uh, 
psychiatric conditions that's um, on that CCSH exam, I'll tell you, is Klein-Levin syndrome. Uh, most, of, most of you have been in the field for any length of time know that this is almost exclusively male. Compulsive overeating, sleeping all day and all night, uh, depression, anxiety, lack of sexual inhibition, episodes lasting from one week to two or three, four months, and then suddenly it just resolves. So um, if you're going to take the exam, and you know, it's, it's great to have that. I think anybody who's in their 20s or 30s and in sleep, you know, you need to get that because the future of sleep, as Byron was talking about, is moving in a couple of different directions, I think, personally. It's like more to home testing, as much to auto path, and then as soon as they can get payment for uh, experienced text work in the doctor's office, this consistent payment, the doctors don't want to talk to folks about sleep hygiene. Not really. It's not cost effective for them. But just like diabetes educators get paid and can put in a charge, we need to be able to put in charges. And so if you haven't gotten that and you think you're going to work for another 10 years or more, I would advise getting it because I, I really think that's where it's going. Uh, ADHD, epidemiology. Okay, we can't really talk about kids without talking about the ones that truly have ADHD. Um, compared to other uh, psychiatric illnesses, um, there are uh, more outward and measurable social um, symptoms. Uh, DSM-3, this really should say DSM-4 at this point, uh, considered excessive movements during sleep to be uh, a criteria for hyperactivity. I don't know that DSM-4 still uh, agrees with that. I've not looked at it, but it's estimated that up to 25% that have severe sleep disorders in infancy and through being toddlers will later qualify for the diagnosis of ADHD again. Not because they have ADHD, because ADHD symptoms and differential you can put side by side with that of obstructive sleep apnea of a, of a child. And without extensive research into the child's history and physical and social uh, sleep history and so forth, very hard to differentiate. Okay. 51 minutes, utter speed up. Okay, so greater variation in onset of sleep. Um, the ADHD children do have much more snoring than those that are without that diagnosis, and there's greater frequency of both PLMs and sleep disorder breathing. Mood disorders. So in depression, uh, up to 88% of adolescents, the report primary insomnia, probably confused with delayed sleep phase syndrome, and up to... Um, 40% uh, of bipolar children had dramatically reduced uh, need for sleep versus those with controls uh, that have ADHD. Um, children are going to naturally you know, display some resistance to, to bedtime, but those with mood disorders, uh, again, primarily males, can have even more. And so at some point, in addition to medical treatment, um, you know, the enlistment of a psychologist or psychiatrist uh, may become necessary. I'm so sorry. I would have to stop and go to settings to turn this on. So I just figure I'll silence it. Okay, so we've got about six minutes left. Um, once the mood disorders are identified independent of ADHD, they can be treated medically and with sleep hygiene, but again, there's no clear data on. Um, what to treat and what not to treat when it comes to insomnia because it can be, again, in children, confused with delayed sleep and it's difficult to differentiate from the mood disorder. Anxiety disorders, uh, sleep problems, nighttime fears. I mean, this all, again, comes back to, you know, how you carve out and how you set up sleep habits and bedtime rituals for children, okay? Bedtime rituals for children as young adults and older adults you know, are a comfort measure, and especially for children because they know what comes next. You're going to have a bath at 7, you're going to have a story at 8, and we're going to turn out the lights at 8.30. Whatever the sequence is, you know, they can count on that. That provides security and helps anchor their uh, sleep hygiene. Um, 
And of course, the nighttime fears and descriptions that children give psychologists and doctors, you know, very widely from animals to monsters and having parents crawl under the bed to look for monsters and so forth. And so you can spend a lot of time with that. Um, occasional nightmares, again, different than uh, night terrors. Night terrors is an episode, not a dream. Um, again, uh, Unfortunately, there's no clear data. There's much more. If Dr. Berber were still working, um, you know, he, he needs an army to deploy an army of folks to research uh, what to do about uh, mood disorders and insomnia in children. So worldwide, we know from the results of 2003's National Sleep Report that you know, children are chronically uh, deprived of sleep, the length of sleep, not their quality some quality and length of sleep. But uh, we know that insufficient sleep you know, can lead to cognitive delays, to poor performance in school, and with the example of little Johnny Rotten, uh, behavioral problems. Uh, Co-sleeping may contribute to that. Uh, again, based on the studies that I pulled, no medical benefit to co-sleeping. In fact, just the opposite, uh, verified by double-blind studies. Uh, and the important thing out there to think to put in there again is that if you're co-sleeping with an infant, you know, you have 10 times greater ability, the infant has 10 times greater chance of experiencing SIDS. Uh, only after women, children are the most underdiagnosed group with sleep disordered breathing. So, subject to any, any of your questions, uh, we're almost ready for the break, and there may be an announcement before that. I don't know, do you have anything? Okay.